In the previous video, I introduced data can cuts. And what I'd like to do in this video is show you how we can do arithmetic with data can cuts. So the first thing I'd like to do is set up addition for data can cuts. So addition is going to be defined in a very intuitive way. So the sum of two data can cuts, or two real numbers, x plus y, is going to be all the rational numbers, q plus r, where q is some element of x and r is some element of y. So you pick something from x and something from y, and their sum, q plus r, is going to be in x plus y. So hopefully that's intuitive. And in fact, one can show that x and y being Dedekind cuts implies that x plus y is also a Dedekind cut. And that's what I'm going to show, to show now. So first I'd like to show that x plus y is not equal to the empty set. So I've got to show that something is in it. And the way to do that is just to pick some q from x and some r from y. And q plus r is guaranteed to be an x plus y. And now showing that x plus y is not equal to all of the rational numbers, well, that just follows from x not being equal to the rational numbers itself, because that's a data can cut, and the same for y. So it's pretty easy to show that as well. And now I'd like to show that uh, x plus y is closed downward. That is, if I find some rational number p, which is less than q plus r, and q plus r is guaranteed to be an x plus y, I'd like to show that p is also going to be an x plus y. So p being less than q plus r, this implies that p minus q is less than r. And I already know that r is in y. So p minus q is less than r, and r is in y. So that means that p minus q is in y. And now I'll just make the observation that I have p, plus, p minus q in y and q in x. And their sum, the sum of q and p minus q, is just p. So that implies that p is an x plus y. And that means x plus y is closed downward. And verifying that, q, or that x plus y has no greatest element, that just follows from x and y not having a greatest element. So that's also easy to show. So we've just shown that x and y being Dedekind cuts implies that x plus y is also a Dedekind cut. Furthermore, the commutative and associative laws for addition come straight out of rational number arithmetic when we're dealing with Dedekind cuts. And it's very easy if you want to verify that yourself. So one other thing we need when considering addition upon Dedekind cuts is the additive identity. That is, the real number, which one added to any other real number, doesn't change it. And we're going to call this just a zero element of R. And the definition of this is also very intuitive. So the zero cut, or zero sub R, is going to be all the rational numbers which are less than zero. So the key fact that I need to verify when checking that the zero that I've just set up is actually the additive identity is this property here, that x plus zero is x. And as always, I'm going to show set equality in two steps. First, I'm going to show that x plus zero is a subset of x. And a way to do that is to just suppose I have some element p within x plus zero. Now, the fact that p is in x plus zero implies that it can be written as q plus r for some q within x and some r within zero. Now, since r is in zero, that implies that r is less than zero, just by the definition of the zero cut, which means r is a negative number. So when I take q plus r, that's got to be less than q. And since I know q is an x and x is closed downward, I have q plus r being less than q. So that means that q plus r is an x. And remember, I said q plus r was equal to p. So that implies that p is an x. So we started with the assumption that p is an x plus 0. And we ended up with a conclusion that p is an x. So that means that x plus 0 is a subset of x. And now the second part of the proof is to show that x is a subset of x plus 0. So now we're going to suppose that p is an x. Since x is a real number, x has no greatest element. So that means it's possible to find some r with an x such that p is less than r, or in other, in other words, r is greater than p. And now just to make the observation that p minus r is less than 0. And since it's less than 0, that means that p minus r must be a member of the 0 cut. 
Now I just make the observation again that if I take r, which I know is an x, and p minus r, which I've just found to be within 0, then this is in x plus 0. And you just look at the sum here. The sum is equal to p. So I've just shown that p is an x plus 0. And just to summarize what I've done here, I've started with the assumption that p is an x. And I've shown that p is an x plus 0. So it means that x is a subset of x plus 0. And now I've shown both inclusions. x plus 0 is a subset of x. And x is a subset of x plus 0. So that shows equality here. The x plus 0 is indeed x. And 0, as I've defined it, is indeed the additive identity. Ultimately, what we want to show is that if I take the set of real numbers and I equip it with some addition operation, then we've just formed an abelian group. So far, what we have, we have closure, we have the commutative and associative laws, and we also have the additive identity. So the last thing we need to set up is an additive inverse. That is the element, which when added to x, will take it to the identity, which is zero. So we're looking for that thing that when I add it to x will give me zero. So basically I have to, well, let's assume I'm, I'm, I'm given x, I want to set up negative x. So how should we do that? So if I take a look at the visual representation of a Dedekind cut, let's say I have two here. So this blue line is going to be the two cut. And then the red line is going to be the negative two cut. So given some x, I want to set up a definition for negative x. So here's the first try. Let me try defining negative x as all the rational numbers that have the property that their negation is not an x. Now this is a pretty good first try. If you just take a look at what's going on here, I, I know that these numbers, negative 2 and downward, should be in negative x. So I take a look at, let's say, negative 4 here, and I observe 4, its opposite, is not an x. And I notice negative 6 here, that should be a negative x, and I notice that its opposite, 6, is not an x. So this is a pretty good first try. The only problem is that negative x is not necessarily a Dedekind cut. That is, it's not a real number. And to see why that is, let's take the example. x is going to be the 2 cut, as I've defined above. It's going to be all the stuff less than 2. Now I make the observation that 2 is not an x, because 2 is not less than 2. So that implies that negative 2 is a negative x. And if you look at what's going on here, negative x would have a greatest element, namely negative 2. So here's my second try at defining negative x. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to define it as it's going to be all the rational numbers such that there exists another rational number r, which is greater than q, such that the negation of r, not necessarily the negation of q, it's the negation of r, that's not going to be an x. For example, I consider the same cuts before. I have the 2 cut here and then the negative 2 cut here. Suppose I want to justify why it is that negative 4 belongs to negative x, why it belongs to the red cut. Well, I'd say that, OK, there's an, uh, another number, for example, negative 3, such that the negation, which I trace out visually along this black line, that's not in the blue cut. So that's why negative 4 is in the red cut. And this prevents greatest elements, because if I want to say, OK, it's negative 2 in here, it wouldn't be in here because there's no r greater than q, such that its negation is not an x. So this is really the definition that's going to work for us. And it's worth spending some time trying to understand what this means, just, just getting comfortable with this definition. But ultimately, one thing we're going to have to show is that, again, if I assume x is a real number, then negative x is also a real number. That is, this is a dedicate cut. And I encourage you to do that as an exercise. What I'd like to verify is that this definition of negative x actually works. It actually serves as a, an additive inverse. That is, the x plus negative x gives me 0. So let's show that. So first, I'm going to show that x plus negative x is a subset of 0. So first, I'm going to suppose I have some p in the set x plus negative x. So as before, this implies that p can be written as q plus r for some q and x. 
and some r with a negative x. And I know since r is a negative x, that means that for some s greater than r, negative x, negative s is not an x. And that's just the definition of the negation of x. Now, as a side note, the following inference is always true. That if I suppose that negative s is less than q, and if q is an x, that implies that negative x must be an x. Now, if I take the contrapositive of that inference, what I have is that negative s not being an x implies that either q is less than or equal to negative s, or that q is not an x. Now, I'm going to sort of ignore this, because I want to assume that q is actually an, an x. And I also noticed that q being equal to negative s leads to contradiction. Namely, right here, if I just substitute negative s here, then I get a contradiction with this statement. So I'm going to use the inference that negative s not being an x implies that q is less than negative s. So ultimately, what I get are two inequalities. I get q is less than negative s, and r is less than s. And that just comes from this inequality up here. So when I add both of these two, what I get is q plus r is less than 0. And remember, q plus r is equal to p. So that means that p is less than 0, which means that p is in the 0 cut. So again, I've started from p being an x, x plus negative x, to concluding that p is in the 0 cut. So that means that x plus negative x is a subset of 0. Now, proving the reverse inclusion is going to be slightly more difficult. And to make it easier, I'm going to introduce a lemma. So the lemma is going to say that if p is any positive rational number and x is any real number, then I can always find some rational number q with an x such that p plus q is not an x. Now, that may sound a little bit strange, but it's actually quite intuitive. Uh, let's consider this red cut here, the negative 2 cut here. And let's suppose I add positive 1 to this cut. So visually, what does that do? What it's going to do is it's going to create the blue cut here. It's going to shift this red cut to the right by one unit. And basically what this lemma is saying, that when I shift it to the right by one unit, or any positive unit, then I always generate some more stuff right here, which wasn't in the red cut before. So I'll leave the proof of that lemma as an exercise, but this is going to make it easier to show that zero is a subset of x plus minus x. So again, let's consider some p in the zero cut. So I know that p is going to be less than zero, which means that negative p is going to be a positive number. And furthermore, that if I cut that positive number in half, that's also going to be a positive number. So negative p over 2 is also going to be greater than 0. Now, by the lemma above, there is some q in an x such that q added to that number, p over, negative p over 2. So q minus p over 2 is not an x. So what I'd like to show is that p minus q is a negative x. Because if I can show that p minus q is a negative x, then q is an x. And I could just sum the two to show that p is an x plus minus x. So that's what we're going to focus on showing now, that p minus q is a negative x. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to define this number s as p over 2 minus q. And notice that's the negation of this. And you'll see why in just a second. So now we're going to consider the following series of inequalities. So p is less than 0. So if I add p to both sides, I get that 2p is less than p. I divide both sides by 2. I get p is less than p over 2. I subtract q from both sides. I get p minus q is less than p over 2 minus q. And notice this right-hand side here is equal to s. So p minus q is less than s. So now I have this s being greater than p minus q. And I know that the negation of s, negative s, is not an x. So what does that mean? That means that p minus q is indeed in negative x. Remember, that's the set criterion for something being in the, in the negation of a set. So now I have q is an x, and p minus q is a negative x. 
So I conclude that P is an X plus minus X. And that's what's going to show that zero is a subset of X plus minus X. And now I've shown both inclusions. So now I have equality between X plus minus X and zero. So what we've done is show that the set of real numbers equipped with addition and also zero as the additive identity is an abelian group. And also, since we have these additive inverses now, we can just start canceling stuff very quickly, or we have the justification for doing that. So suppose we had x plus y equals x plus z, and these, these are all real numbers here. So our instinct is just, yeah, let's cancel out the x's. But let's see why we've sort of earned the, the right to do that. So we can add negative x to both sides. So now I see that negative x plus x is equal to 0. Same thing for that side. So I now have 0 plus y is equal to 0 plus z. And I have also earned the right to show that uh, 0 plus y, or to say that 0 plus y is equal to y, and 0 plus z is equal to z. So I've essentially proven this cancellation law. And what we also have, we've also earned the right to declare the, the sort of familiar properties of real number inequalities. That is, if x is less than y, then if I add something to both sides, then x plus z is less than y plus z. So we've taken care of addition for Dedekind cuts. So now let's set up multiplication. Now multiplication for Dedekind cuts is going to be a little bit more involved in that we're going to have to pay close attention to the signs of these Dedekind cuts, whether they're negative or non-negative. So what's going to help us out is to define absolute value. So I'm going to say that the absolute value of x is going to be x union negative x. And hopefully this should be pretty intuitive why we're going to set it up like this, because let's say we have the blue cut here, the two cut. We want to say that the absolute value of this is itself. So I can see that when I union blue, the blue cut, with its negative, the red cut, I just get the blue cut. So indeed, the absolute value of 2 is going to end up being 2. And furthermore, I want to say that the absolute value of this negative cut is the blue cut. So when I union the two, again, I get the blue cut. So when I set up the absolute value this way, I get three theorems immediately coming out that if x is greater than or equal to 0, then the absolute value of x is equal to x. If x is less than 0, then the absolute value is the same as negating x. And thirdly, that the absolute value of x is always greater than or equal to 0. And the proofs of those are quite easy. And I'll leave those to you as an exercise. So now let's think about actually writing down the definition for multiplying two real numbers, x and y. And let's start out with a simple case where both of these real numbers are positive. So let's consider this two cut in red and a three cut in blue. So basically I just want to multiply two times three. And ultimately what I want is this black cut here, the six cut. Now, if I just set up a definition, a really simple definition, which is just multiply each element of the blue and red cuts pairwise, the problem is going to become known when I start multiplying very large negative values because both the red and blue cut contain numbers like negative 20 billion. So when I multiply those two together, I'm going to get very large positive numbers. And hopefully it's obvious that it's not going to be this black cut. So an alternate strategy, and the strategy that we're going to adopt, is when we multiply the red and blue cut, we're going to temporarily ignore all the stuff below zero. So we're just going to focus on stuff in the interval zero to two, in this case, and zero to three, in this case. And then we're going to multiply those pairwise. So when I do that, I'm going to generate the numbers from 0 to 6. And now just to extend it all the way to the left, I can just take that mini cut 0 through 6 and just union that with the 0 cut, which is going to extend it leftward. So to write that out symbolically, if x and y are both non-negative real numbers, then x plus y is going to be 0, the 0 cut, union with the pairwise multiplication under the condition that both R and S, 
those elements selected from x and y are going to be greater than or equal to zero. And of course, r is from x and s is from y. So this is going to be the definition for a non-negative real number. And now since I've set up the definition for a non-negative number, if one of x and y is negative, then the solution is start considering absolute values so that I can start considering non-negative numbers. So if I have x times y, if either x or y is negative, what I'm going to do is stick a negative out front and then just take the product of the absolute values because these absolute values are always guaranteed to be non-negative. And then once I set up this definition for non-negative numbers, I basically revert to this first definition. So this is going to be the rule that I use when exactly one of x or y is negative. And then when they're both negative, I just take the product of absolute values. And again, the product of, or I should say the absolute value is going to be non-negative. So I just revert to this first definition. So as I did with addition, I'd ideally like to show that the set R equipped with multiplication forms an abelian group. That is, I'd like to show closure under the operation, commutative and associative laws with the operation, the existence of a multiplicative identity and a multiplicative inverse. And then I'd like to prove the distributive property, which when combined with the addition and multiplication properties would imply that the set R is a field. And uh, there's only so much I can cover in one video. So if I've left anything out, either in the video or in the practice realms, I certainly encourage you to prove it. And an, an additional property of R, sort of the whole motivation for creating the real numbers, is this uh, least upper bound property, which Q doesn't have. So R has the least upper bound property. And in terms of terminology, what you would say is that a field that has the least upper bound property or the supremum property is a complete field. As you can hopefully see, there's a lot of stuff that you can prove if you're interested in this, uh, in this material. And I'd like to wrap up the video by just proving the commutative law for multiplication. So the way I'm going to sh show that is in two steps. I'm going to introduce a lemma first, which is going to say that if X and Y are non-negative, if they're greater than or equal to zero, then X and Y commute for the reason that it's super obvious when x and y are greater than or equal to zero. If you just look at the definition here, when x and y are not negative, x times y is just the zero cut union with rs and just that whole condition there. And notice I can just swap that. I know rational numbers commute. So rs is equal to sr, same condition here. And then notice this is just a definition for y times x. So when x and y are greater than or equal to zero, it's pretty obvious that x and y commute. Of course, what I'd ultimately like to show is that x and y commute for any choice of x and y, whether they're negative or non-negative. And a, a clean way of doing that is to introduce yet another lemma, saying that if, again, if x and y are non-negative, greater than or equal to zero, then negative x times y is equal to the negation of x times y which is also equal to x times negative y, basically saying that this negative sign can be moved around as you'd like it. You can take it out of x and y, you can sort of factor it out, or you can like you can bring it back in, or you can just swap it to the other factor there. And this is something that has to be proven, and you can't sort of use your habit in, in moving this around to, to justify this. So this is something that needs to be proven. So if x and y, are greater than or equal to zero, then their negations are less than or equal to zero. And hopefully you can see why that is just from our talk of Dedekind cuts. And I encourage you to verify the cases where X and Y are equal to zero on your own. And essentially what we're gonna end up proving is that something, something times zero is zero. So now we're gonna consider the case where X and Y are strictly greater than zero. So what that means is that if I have negative x times y, I know that negative x is negative. That's because x is positive. So I'm going to use the definition for multiplying when I have exactly one negative number. So remember what that is, I take negative sign out front, or I stick a negative sign out front, 
and I just multiply the absolute values. And hopefully you can see that the absolute value of negative x, in this case, is going to be x. So this shows that negative x times y is equal to the negation of x times y. And furthermore, if I start with x times negative y, again, negative y is guaranteed, guaranteed to be negative because y is strictly positive. Again, I use the rule for multiplying when I have exactly one negative factor. Take the negative sign out front, multiply the absolute values, and I get the same thing here, the, neg the negation of x times y. So that shows that all three of these propositions are equivalent. So the tools that I have at my disposal thus far would be that if x and y are non-negative, then x and y commute. And then if they're non-negative, then I can just shuffle around this negative sign as I please. And these are the tools that are going to allow us to prove the commutative law for any x and y. So this is just a statement here that x and y commute over multiplication. And I'm going to have to divide this up into four cases. So case one, where x and y are non-negative, that's already been taken care of. Case two, x is non-negative and y is negative. So I have I start with x times y, and I want to show that's equal to y times x. So I just use the multiplication definition for when I have one negative factor. So I take a negative sign out front, take the absolute values. So that's going to be equal to the negation of x times minus y. Now notice here that x is non-negative and negative y, since y is negative, negative y is non-negative. And I know now that x and negative y commute. So I just swap the order here. x times minus y is equal to minus y times x. And again, since these two are both non-negative, I can take that negative sign out front and negative negative y is equal to y. So that proves the commutative law in that case. And now you can sort of pause the video if you want and just go through this case. This is very, very similar. The case where x is negative and y is not negative. And again, just by swapping stuff around, you can get the commutative law like that. And finally, I have the case where both x and y are negative. So for this, I have x times y. I used the definition for multiplication when both factors are negative. So I just take the product of absolute values. Since x and y are negative, their absolute values are going to be the negations. So x times y is going to be equal to negative x times negative y. And since x and y are negative, the negations are positive. And I know that negative x is going to commute with negative y. So that's equal to negative y times negative x. And notice that this is indeed equal to y times x, because if I started with y times x, I use the definition for multiplying two negative numbers together, and I would have also reached negative y times negative x. So that proves it in this case. So I now have the commutative law for multiplication. So now we've sort of earned the right to swap these around as we'd like. So that wraps up this video. Uh, quite a bit of material this time, but hopefully it's still interesting, especially if you like things like uh, abstract algebra and real analysis. So here are the practice problems for this session. Again, quite a bit of work this time. And uh, stay tuned for more videos on set theory. And as always, feel free to subscribe if you enjoyed the videos or give the video a thumbs up. Thanks for watching.